Oral questions by members? Leader of the Official Opposition. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, this Premier's dangerous experiment to decriminalize and normalize the use of hard, dangerous drugs has devastated lives and shattered communities. British Columbians are now forced to make an unacceptable choice between sharing a hotel room with cockroaches or someone smoking fentanyl. And the Premier's so-called safe supply program has been a gift to drug traffickers, flooding the market and slashing the street value of hydromorphone by 95 percent, all funded by taxpayers. These cheap taxpayer-funded drugs are marketed as safe for teenagers, with online platforms like Reddit and Snapchat providing easy access to these highly addictive drugs. So my question to the Premier, when will the Premier protect our kids from his so-called safe supply drugs and end his entirely disastrous policy of taxpayer-funded drugs and decriminalization? Minister of Mental Health and Addictions. Thank you very much, Honourable Speaker, and thank you to the member for the question. I think it's really important that we do take opportunities to talk about child and youth mental health uh, when we are in this place. Um, we, of course, are concerned about the, uh, about the, about the state of child and youth mental health uh, for, ki for kids in our, in, our, in our communities and in our province. And I uh, want to assure the member that these are also issues that our, our health system, that, that, that doctors, that, that child and youth mental health clinicians are also very seized with and very concerned with as they, uh, as they provide care for, uh, for kids who need, who need care and support. And frankly, it doesn't matter where uh, prescription medications come from, whether it's from their parents' uh, medicine cabinet or from, where, or from elsewhere, we do not want kids taking drugs. We do not want kids to get wrapped up in the illicit drug supply. Uh, and so that is work that we, uh, that we do, again, uh, with, uh, with our child and youth mental health system, with our health system, um, to ensure that we are addressing any, um, uh, any concerns that have come forward with, with respect to, um, uh, with respect to uh, it, um, uh, it issues around diversion. Our health system is on alert, uh, and we have provisions in place to be monitoring very carefully what's happening with our Safer Supply Program. We'll continue to do that work. Thank you. Leader of the Official Opposition Supplemental. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. But, you know, regardless, the issue uh, to the Minister is that British Columbians are now forced to make unacceptable choices between sharing hospital rooms with cockroaches or somebody smoking fentanyl. Now, the Premier's permissive drug policies have normalized Members. illicit drug use, letting the genie out of the bottle by ensuring there are no consequences to using dangerous drugs. Shockingly, online platforms now sell illicit drugs like MDMA, ketamine, and cocaine with a simple click, directly targeting BC Facebook users with flashy Member, enticing ads. Members, please. These websites promise easy access to pills marketed to youth with names like Molly Gummy Bears, Blue Dolphin Pill, Homer Simpson Pill, and Mickey Mouse Pill. This nonsense is made possible only because there is little to no consequences under this reckless NDP decriminalization program. The Premier said that he would destigmatize drug use. Well, don't worry, Premier. Mission accomplished. So my question is, with such deadly products targeted at youth and normalized here in British Columbia, when will the Premier recognize the damage of his policies and scrap this entire reckless decriminalization okay. program? Minister. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Honourable Speaker. And uh, I just want to assure British Columbians that, in fact, we have taken steps through our health care system to ensure, again, uh, that we are supporting our, uh, our health care providers, supporting our doctors and nurses who are caring for people with substance use disorder to ensure that they are, uh, that they are using their medications appropriately. We've been worked to update the medication options so that, uh, so that, uh, so that, so that physicians can more closely match 
um, the, the medications that people are needing. We are making witness uh, dosing, the default for, for new medications, a number of supports on that side, um, uh, Honourable Speaker. But what I would say, again, to put this situation in context, Honourable Speaker, is we lost more than 2,500 British Columbians last year to a toxic drug supply that has amounts of fentanyl absolutely off the charts, contaminants that are creating uh, all kinds of uh, 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 vicious secondary effects um, to people's physical uh, health. And when we work with all of our partners uh, across this space to try to come together to turn the dial on this crisis, what our law enforcement partners tell us is so important is that what they need to focus on is con in consideration of the volume or potential volume to scale up diverted uh, prescriptions or diverted safe supply, it pales, pales in comparison to what organized Thank crime you. is doing in terms of fentanyl production, importation and exportation. And this is where we focus our efforts here in Vancouver. Honourable Speaker, we have to get in between what organized crime is doing to our communities Thank and you. kids, and that's the focus of our agenda. Please make sure that our questions and answers are brief. Sir, it's out. Thank you, Honourable Speaker. Uh, the Minister is right. We have lost more than 2,500 people in British Columbia last year to overdose, and yet this government puts no focus on prevention, here, here. no over warnings on the dangers of using drugs, whether they are illicit drugs or prescription drugs. And these publicly available online platforms make purchasing deadly illicit drugs as normal as shopping for online groceries. <clears throat> The websites list drugs such as ketamine, pressed Xanax tablets, and cocaine off the brick Superman, each with glossy photos and enticing descriptions. And shockingly, illicit cocaine is marketed as, and I quote, safe supply. The commercialization of cocaine has arrived, bolstered by the NDP government messaging about destigmatizing drugs and dangerously named safe supply. So my question, Mr. Speaker, is when will the Premier protect our youth from drugs and finally put an end to his failed decriminalization policies? Minister. Uh, thank you, uh, thank you, Honourable Speaker, and, and, and thanks to the member for raising what I think we all agree is a really important issue with respect to how we talk with youth in these times in the context of the toxic drug supply. Uh, that's a very important issue. We agree on that. And that's why, Honourable Speaker, we have a campaign that is, ta is targeted to pointing kids to the dangers of the illicit drug supply right now. That's why we have helpstartshere.bc.ca, and I would implore anyone who needs help to reach out to the supports that are available uh, through, uh, through, through, that, through that website. It is imperative, uh, imperative that uh, we work upstream, that we work in a preventative way, which is why we have 35 foundry sites, um, uh, Honourable Speaker. That's why we just announced an additional eight integrated child and youth mental health teams. We have never seen the kind of investment we're making in our youth in terms of supporting their, uh, their, their mental health in, uh, in these times. We're going to continue to do that work. Sorry, South Supplemental. Speaker, the minister mentions her website, and I wonder how many youth actually access that website compared to this website. These digital drug dens, they're just a click away. And with the normalization of illicit drug use thriving under the NDP and the marketing that aggressively targets our youth, one of the Facebook ads features a double points promo, promising double the rewards points on illicit drug pur purchases until May 3rd. Turning addiction into a loyalty program, Mr. Speaker, from Molly gummy bears to LSD Oreo cookies. These drugs are peddled as candy. Decriminalizing and normalizing illicit drug use, it's a catastrophic NDP policy failure. So my question, Mr. Speaker, is when will the Premier wake up to the wave of addiction caused by his policies and scrap his decriminalization nightmare? Minister. Thank you, Honourable Speaker. 
Uh, you know, I mean, frankly, the member is simply wrong to suggest that we support uh, the, 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 the marketing by organized crime that is preying on young people in our communities. To suggest that we're not just as concerned is, uh, I mean, everybody members, in this House, members. every single person in this House, members. every single person across our health care system, across our child and mental health system, is concerned to ensure that we are providing as many supports as possible to children and, to children and youth. That is why we are investing in all of the upstream supports. It is why we are working with experts uh, on, on how, we, how we best engage with youth and talk with youth. It's why our health authorities have outreach workers working with youth, a street entrenched youth to try and connect them to services to try and build trust. That's the work that we have to come together to do. We should all be together in this House against organized crime who are preying on our young people. That's the responsibility of every member in this House. Leader of the Third Party. Thank you, Honourable Speaker. Endometriosis affects one in ten women around the globe and approximately one million people in Canada. There are many unknowns about the disease, but the personal experiences are undeniable. People with endometriosis have described their pain as excruciating, debilitating. They experience vomiting, fainting, and chronic pain that takes them away from work and life. People formally diagnosed with endometriosis have better physical and mental health outcomes, with lower rates of depression and anxiety than those who go undiagnosed. Yet the rate of diagnosis in BC, like many places around the world, is dismally low. The average length time for a diagnosis is between seven and nine years. Many male doctors who have no direct experience of menstruation continue to dismiss and deny patients' concerns and pain. My question is to the Minister of Health. What is his government doing to improve the diagnosis and care for people with endometriosis? Minister of Health. Uh, Honourable Speaker, uh, endometriosis is um, a, a terrible condition for uh, many women in our communities. Uh, it's critically important, Honourable Speaker, that we continue through both our in-person and virtual platforms to ensure better care for people. So part of that is the recruitment of more family doctors and nurse practitioners. And as the member knows, the vast majority of younger doctors in this day and age are women, not men, which itself is an important improvement in service and, and understanding of this uh, serious, uh, serious illness. But one of the key aspects of what we're doing is expanding primary care for people in community. That means primary care networks that involve team-based care, that involve doctors and nurses and nurse practitioners and others who provide support for people equally. Honourable Speaker, we are engaged in a health human resources plan which significantly expands primary care for people and communities. And through the Provincial Health Services Authority and BC Women's, we are continuing to ensure that that, that community of primary care, which is essential to dealing with something such as endometriosis, is strong and informed. Leader of the Third Party Supplemental. Uh, thank you, Honourable Speaker, and thank you to the Minister for the response. Birth, death, menopause. These are a few of the guarantees for half the, the, half the population. And yet menopause, like many issues related to women's reproductive health, continues to be a hushed discussion. When women approach middle age, they're lurched into a world of sweat, pain, and tears. Indeed, through every stage of life, experiences with menstruation, endometriosis, and menopause are too often dismissed by much of the healthcare system. People are taking to TikTok to raise awareness about the pain associated with the insertion of IUDs. And it sparked yet another discussion about the health system and how it dismisses and denies women's pain. The Provincial Women's Health Strategy was released in 2008, and the Provincial Health Officer's Report on Women's Health and Wellbeing in 2011. Yet, well over a decade later, we've seen no updates. My question is to the Minister of Health. Will he commit to an updated report that shows where progress is happening and where it's lacking when it comes to women's health and well-being? Minister of Health. Uh, yes, Honourable Speaker. And, and <coughs> further, I would say we have seen very significant progress in support for women's health in the last number of years, progress that we've worked together in the legislature together on, progress in terms of uh, women's ac access to reproductive choice in our province, progress, Honourable Speaker, in access to contraception, progress from the community 
on issues of, su of support for women and menstruation products that came from the whole community and has transformative to the way people view our province? So the answer is yes. House Leader of the Fourth Party. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Yesterday on Connect FM, this NDP Premier chuckled at the idea that drug users and addicts require hospitalization more often because they sometimes, and I quote, break their legs, unquote. Mr. Speaker, I don't find that funny, not one bit. British Columbians expect a serious, measured approach to addictions, and they're not getting it from this NDP government. People getting hurt is not funny. Open drug use in parks and playgrounds is not funny. BC teens like Camilla Sword and Port Coquitlam overdosing on NDP safe supply is not funny. My question to the Solicitor General, when will you admit that Camilla Sword did not need to die and when will you repeal your failed chair, safe member. supply policy? Through the Chair. Minister. Thank you, Honourable Speaker, and I know that every single person in this House uh, feels uh, compassion and the grief that Mr. Sword and his family feel at the loss of, of Camilla and the impact of, uh, you know, what is, uh, what, is a, what is a challenging time when it comes to child and youth mental health right now for, for kids. And, Honourable Speaker, that's why we're doing the work that is so necessary to do to provide supports to children and youth, uh, working with our school system, working with our uh, child and youth mental health system to provide those upstream supports that are absolutely critical in intervening so that we catch problems uh, before they get into the, in, in, to turn into larger problems that result in uh, challenges with addiction and more serious mental health issues. Uh, we're going to continue to do that work with all of our partners. Member Supplemental. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. This NDP government has been fundamentally unserious in its approach towards the drug and addiction crisis in British Columbia. This is not a compassionate government. Just last week in a private meeting, Mayor Brad West told our team that while he has personally been in touch with Greg Sward, the father of Camellia Sward, the local MLA for Port Coquitlam, BC Solicitor General, pawned Greg Sword off to constituency staff. He would not take a meeting. Mr. Speaker, Conservatives are asking for compassion and common sense. Will this Solicitor General commit to cancelling safe supply and performing an audit to, ter to determine just how much money has been trans transferred from taxpayers to drug traffickers as a result of diverted safe supply. Minister of Mental Health and Addictions. Thank you, Honourable Speaker. And again, I, 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 find it, uh, I find it important and necessary in this line of, uh, of important discussion in the House uh, that, that, that British Columbians expect us to be taking extremely seriously. Uh, when, when we consider the loss that our communities are experiencing, over 2,500 British Columbians last year, a toxic drug crisis that bedevils um, all of, our, all of our, authority, our authorities, all of our jurisdictions across the country, where we see you know, in, in, you know, very high increases in mortality next door in Alberta, for, for example. You know, our, 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 our physicians and nurses and outreach workers on the front lines who are doing this work, who are working with children and youth, um, are, are absolutely alive to all of uh, the issues and concerns uh, that uh, the member raised with respect to, um, to how they need to be uh, in a position to access pathways uh, to care. Uh, we have law enforcement very much on, um, on alert. We have our health system on alert around the, doing the very best that we can do to ensure that we have proper pathways to care for children and youth. We're going to continue to do that work with our partners, Honourable Speaker. Member for Kamloops, North Thompson. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Well, well, it's very clear that with five months to go before an election, the Premier is suddenly concerned about what he's been hearing for the last 15 months of pressure across British Columbia, from VC United to municipalities to other agencies. The Premier is now in full political control mode 
with the election on the horizon. Yet he refuses to end decriminalization despite the carnage in our streets and in our hospitals. And I wonder why, Mr. Speaker, it's because he very clearly has a decrim caucus. His Minister of Mental Health and Addiction said on Friday she remains committed to, and I quote, the original objectives of decriminalization. And let's take a look at what those objectives might be, Mr. Speaker, because two years ago the Health Minister said, and I quote, we're ready for decriminalization. We support that. We think it's necessary. It's fair to say that we don't think two and a half grams is enough, end quote, Mr. Speaker. They didn't think two and a half grams was enough drugs to be flooding our streets with. No, they wanted it to even be more. Let's be clear, NDP ministers of the decrim caucus want more decriminalization, not less. Will the Premier finally say no to his decrim caucus, adopt BC United's plan to scrap his failed decriminalization disaster today? Yeah. <laughs> Minister of Public Safety and Solicitor General. Thank you, uh, Honourable Speaker, and I appreciate the, uh, the question uh, from the member. Decriminalization has never been about public drug use. We've never supported public drug use, ever, in this House, Honourable Speaker. Decriminalization has been about saving lives, Honourable Speaker. <laughs> saving lives from the very beginning. And given what we've heard from the opposition in the past, I thought that's what they believed as well, Honourable Speaker. Clearly, things have changed. Let's go back to what the Leader of the Opposition said. Some of the Chiefs of Police were supportive of decriminalization. What they are supportive of is not change, charging people for small amounts of drugs, and I agree with that, Honourable Speaker. Those are the words of the Leader of the Opposition, Honourable Speaker. And that's why when we brought in the changes that we did, we worked and, we worked and consulted with police to ensure that we're both on the same page, Honourable Speaker. Those are the limits that were put in place, Honourable Speaker. And it, when it became clear that communities had concern about public drug use, which again, as I said, was never, ever condoned or anticipated or, or approved of, Honourable Speaker, we worked with local government, we worked with police to put in place the changes that were announced on Friday to ensure that we keep our communities safe, that public drug use is something that will not be tolerated, Honourable Speaker. Member for Richmond North Centre. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. This NDP caucus is openly proud of their pro-drug policies. The member for Richmond South Centre, and I, he says, and I quote, one thing I do want to take a bit of pride in is the effort of working to decriminalise illicit drugs for personal usage, end quote. That's right. This NDP MLA from Richmond South Centre is proud of decriminalisation illicit drugs. Mem members, members, and mem so is his NDP colleague from Richmond, members, Queensborough, who said, I quote, decriminalization works. Again, the facts are clear. Decriminalization works well, end quote. While the NDP celebrate their radical drug policies, our communities suffer from chaos and disorder. Will the Premier finally say no to his decrim caucus and adopt BC United's plan to scrap his failed decriminalisation disaster? Solicitor General. Thank you, uh, Honourable, uh, Honourable Speaker. Uh, and again, I appreciate the, uh, the question from the Honourable Member. Um, and she could not be more wrong in her comments, Honourable Speaker. We have never, ever supported open drug use, Honourable Speaker. We have never, ever, or ever would, as any other member of this chamber would, encourage the use of illegal drugs, Honourable Speaker. What Oh, thank you, Honourable Speaker. Thank you, Honourable Speaker. Let me address that point right now, because I have heard that 
um, that statement from members of the BC uh, on the opposition on the other side, and that is an absolutely false statement. There is not and there will not be an overdose prevention site in the, Rich in the Richmond Hospital, Honourable Speaker. Let's be really clear about that, and the member should take that message back to her constituents because that's a fact, Honourable Member. This has been about saving lives, Honourable Speaker, saving lives in a toxic drug crisis that has been plaguing this province, every other province, continent-wide, and is in fact global, Honourable Speaker. And we are taking the steps required to keep, to keep communities safe, working with police, working with the UBCM, working with the public, and addressing their concerns. That's what Friday's announcement was all about, Honourable Speaker, and there will be further changes in future that help deal with the fight against organized crime and those who peddle and prey on the most vulnerable. Member for Kelowna Mission. The NDP Premier's Decrim Caucus is aggressively pushing for an expanded decriminalization and so-called safe supply. Let, let's hear the question, please. Look no further than the NDP's latest anti-police, pro-decrim candidate, Christine Boyle, the Premier's close friend and hand-picked candidate in Vancouver. This is what she says, and I quote, we are lobbying hard, loudly, almost unanimously around safe supply, around decriminalization, end quote. Clearly, NDP radicals want to fast-track an expansion of the Premier's disastrous decriminalization experiment. Will the Premier finally say no to his decrim caucus and adopt BC United's plan to scrap his failed decriminalization disaster? Solicitor General. Thank you, uh, thank you, Honourable Speaker. Uh, and I listen to the members opposite, and uh, um, you know, you get uh, on one day you get one set of words from the uh, the leader of the opposition saying end end decrim, and then uh, previous comments from the uh, the leader of the opposition. Uh, again, I'll repeat it because they don't seem to uh, to understand it. I think the Conservatives down the end of uh, remember this quote from from the leader of the opposition. Some of the chiefs of police who were supportive of decriminalization and what they were supportive of is not charging people for small amounts of drugs, and I agree with that, Honourable Speaker. Those are the very words of the Leader of the Opposition, Honourable Speaker. The, uh, and then, and, then, and then, the the, then the member from South Surrey, does it mean that our party doesn't support decrim or harm reduction? Absolutely not. We do with whole hearts, Honourable Speaker. We want to save people, Honourable Speaker. Honourable Speaker, this side of the House knows what matters, which is saving lives. That's what our policies are designed to do. We also know the importance of listening to the public and listening to, to police. That's why we made the changes that we did on Friday, Honourable Speaker. And I will tell you something else, Honourable Speaker, that when it comes in to putting in place policies that supporting police, this side has been doing it for the last seven years, whether it's hiring more RCMP officers than any other jurisdiction in the, in the, in the history of this block or this country, Honourable Speaker, putting in place controls that are needed. We have done that every single time, and we'll continue to do that. Prince George will mount. Well, the uh, Solicitor General can bluster all he wants, but the words of the NDP decrim caucus Shh. shows members, what members. this government truly believes. Members. The member from Nanaimo, North Cowichan, said, and I quote, not a single life will be saved by cancelling decriminalization in this province, and it's clear that we are turning the corner, end quote. What is clear? is the utter chaos and social disorder in our streets, in our hospitals, and a record 2,546 lives lost to the overdose crisis last year alone. Will the Premier finally say no to his decrim caucus, adopt BC United's plan to scrap his failed dis decriminalization disaster? Solicitor General. Minister, thank you, uh, thank you, Honourable Speaker, and I appreciate the uh, the question uh, from the uh, from the member. Um, I thought they believed, Honourable Speaker, that addiction uh, was a health matter, Honourable Speaker. That's what we thought. 
when they supported the all-party committee um, report in this House, Honourable Speaker. Clearly, they've changed their mind. And they appear to change their mind because of the actions of, of the QAnon caucus down at the other end of the, uh, the aisle there, Honourable Speaker. Let's be clear. Police have made it clear that addiction is a health issue, not a criminal issue. What they want is tools to help keep communities safe, to deal with public drug use, which is what the public was asking for, which is what communities were asking for, Honourable Speaker. And that's what we introduced on Friday. We are going to continue to engage and put in place policies in terms of supports and treatments and new beds and mental, mental health supports to ensure that those who want to recover are able to do that, Honourable Speaker, Be because that's what matters. That's what this side of the House is all about, Honourable Speaker, keeping communities safe and ensuring people get healthy. The bell and the question period.